So it's been a while since Odyssey Outsura's reboot by David Productions began airing back in October of 2022. And for those looking for any context, or if you're new to the series, I've got quite a few other videos that cover Odyssey Atsura's origins, the characters, and a bunch of other fun facts about it. So I'll put those links in the description for you to check out. But anyway, let's dive right into what I think of the new anime. So I'm glad to say that the new Odyssey Atsura series has a very robust start. This was crucial since it's a pretty old show, and making it to match the modern era while respecting the 80 source material is a hard balance to achieve. Luckily, David Productions pretty much nailed it. I'll admit, I was a bit nervous when I saw all the social media nods in the first opening with Lum, but as it turns out, that was a bit of a gimmick. In reality, Arlese Atsura 2022 is ambiguous enough that I think it could easily exist as either a show set in modern day or back in the 80s or 90s. In short, I think the writers wanted to preserve the setting of the source material, but without making it a retro throwback series in order to distinguish it as a modern piece of media, apart from the many other adaptations. And I can't complain because at the end of the day, if I really want the super retro experience, I'll just do what most people will do and watch the old anime. That being said, there are things I like about this series better. First off, I have to admit, it's clear when you go back and watch the original Odyssey Atsura that the animation in the first season or two is pretty rudimentary. It's not terrible, but it is very dated, and the thing that sucks is that I feel a lot of people won't get through that to the later seasons, which in my opinion are some of the most cinematic and beautiful animation of the era. I mean, the detail and the atmosphere in these episodes has an emotional resonation that stays with you, and there's just something so timeless about the care that's been put into it. I think nowadays the expectation is to create a consistent look throughout animation, and with seasons being shorter than ever, most of the time the evolution of a work from start to finish isn't immediately distinguishable. And while I think consistency in your work is great and a striving factor, I also love seeing how the animators on the original Kitty Films production just kept getting better and better and better until they were so good that they would go on to experiment with new artistic styles that would help shape the future of anime through feature films and other projects. And despite the fact that the older Odyssey Atsura series will always be my favorite in terms of its aesthetic charm, I have to say the reboot's animation is absolutely fantastic, and one of its strongest selling points. Almost every character is very faithful to the manga in the way they look and move, and Lum even has her rainbow-colored hair, which was changed to the iconic green color in the original anime due to the difficulty of creating it through cell animation. There are, of course, some drawbacks, like how some of the detail has been limited, particularly with characters like Magane, who, love him or hate him, was very expressive and well-animated in the original. Now he just kinda looks like a potato with glasses. We did get Kosuke as a trade-off though, Ataru's original friend from the manga, so there's that anyway. The characters also sound great for the most part. Sumire Uesaka and Hiroshi Kamiya do an incredible job as the iconic couple, and despite what some may say, I think they live up to the task in pretty much every way. I also checked out the dub, and while it's definitely not my cup of tea, I think they do a pretty good job as well. In regards to the casting quality, I'd say this for almost everyone. There are a couple of characters such as Sakura and Ryanosuke who I feel don't perfectly fit their roles, but it hasn't ever bothered me or anything. Plus having the legends themselves play Ataru's parents really hits home that there was a lot of love and thought put into the casting of this series. But anyway, that's a lot of the super positive stuff. Now let's move on to one of the biggest subjects of this video, pacing. So the pacing is interesting, and by interesting I mean a bit frantic. So if you spent some time with the series, you probably know the manga is broken up into roughly 374 chapters, and around 6,000 pages, and the original anime managed to adapt a lot of those through its 195 episode run of two-part stories. So at a runtime of about 46 episodes, the new adaptations got an ocean of material to choose from including not only the manga, but also the original anime episodes and the movies as well. Check out my video on the best stories to adapt for more on that. The thing is, with so many things to adapt, the studio had two options. Take a handful of the best plus a new few stories and make the show, or cram as much stuff into each time slot that they can possibly fit without losing the gist of the story. And what they have seemingly chosen to do is definitely closer to the latter option. 
Now I have to say that the comedic, outspoken, bombastic, and loud tone of the series fits relatively well with the quick pace of the stories. For the most part, even in the episodes where they combine more than one narrative together, I can still tell there was a lot of care taken in not neutering the writing to a ridiculous amount. And there haven't been a ton of the heartfelt ones yet, which are admittedly my favorite chapters, but David Production did prove with how I've waited for you and since your parting that they can also beautifully adapt the romantic stories as well. What's puzzling to me is sometimes they'll try to cram three stories into one episode, which is just too much. I get that the chapters vary in size, but I still think three is just gunning it a bit too much for efficiency. Now, they haven't done this a lot yet, which is good, but there's no guarantee this trend won't continue, which brings me to my biggest confusion I have with this series adaptation. The Order of Episodes. It seems as though the goal of this adaptation is clear. Introduce as many characters as possible. The thing is, characters like Ryanosuke and her dad didn't even show up until about halfway through the series or more, and Ran and Ten had a few books before they made their debut. At its core, Arlese Atsura is a character-driven narrative, which is probably why they're doing this. They're almost halfway done with the adaptation and they still haven't brought in all of the cast, so it's understandable why this approach might seem necessary. And as a first-time viewer, it probably doesn't seem weird at all. I did say in my original video that you could skip around reading slash watching Arlese Atsura, and because of its weekly resetting storylines, the series never relied on reading order whether it was chapter 5 or chapter 175, and I still think that mostly holds up here. It's just, as a fan, I feel they might be skipping over some of the best episodes and leaving things a bit abridged. A lot of the great stories came in the books between the introductions of different main characters, but since those books are skipped over in favor of rushing to adapt new character introductions, we jump from like chapter 6 to chapter 82, and there isn't much of an incentive at that point to turn around and adapt one of the earlier chapters that was just skipped over. New characters being paced out between books or seasons allowed current characters to be focused on and developed properly, so that by the time Lum's friends were fully established or Tone's sister Asuka showed up, we'd already spent a lot of the series watching the other characters grow and were ready for a new challenger to arrive. But with the new series, sometimes watching a new episode can feel like emerging from the water to breathe and being shoved straight back down again without getting any air. To be honest, I think most of the character introductions have been done pretty well, and it's clearly the direction they've chosen, so in that sense I'd say they're doing a solid job. It's just that I feel that things are going a bit too quickly, which can affect the pacing and the continuity. Moving on, the tone is kind of interesting. As I said earlier, I feel that the tender moments have been done really well in this series, and that despite the fast pace and condensed narrative style, the stories pretty closely follow the source material. One of the things I really liked about the original anime is how it was able to shift from happy to sad to wacky to dramatic in a very smooth way which never felt too immersive, breaking, or weird. And though it wasn't perfect, I think it laid a pretty good foundation for what this show could do. And so far, the reboot seems to know when it wants to slow down and tell a loving story, or when it should speed back up to tell a comedic one. We get a similar overly bombastic and super loud presentation for most of the episodes, but to be honest, this does a decent job at translating the comedy from the manga and pointing out a lot of the absurdity of Lum and Nataru's adventures. The show never takes itself too seriously which is really good, and in some cases I'm even hoping it diverts a bit from the original manga. Like if Ryanosuke could finally get to wear a dress like she's always wanted, instead of always being the butt of her dad's jokes and failing to see the dream become a reality. Now that's a change I'd love to see. But I'd have to say, among everything, the music is probably my least favorite thing about this adaptation. And I'm not talking about the openings and endings, those are really great and a very strong pull into each episode. I'm talking about the rest of the background music. Anime soundtracks are often some of my favorite aspects of certain series, such as the allure of Maiden Abyss, the cold enchanting aura of Madoka Magica, the commanding blows of Attack on Titan, or the heartbreaking beauty of Violet Evergarden. These shows all harness their music to create an atmosphere that elevates every aspect of the narrative, something that manga on its own can't really do. And comedy does this too. Just look at Yuji Nomi's work on Nichijou's soundtrack absolutely fantastic. 
But Arlesea Atsura 2022, despite having a rather large soundtrack, doesn't seem to have that many memorable moments. It also has a tendency to recycle the same admittedly bland songs, and to be honest, I feel it takes a backseat to the beloved soundtrack of the original anime. Don't get me wrong, there are very good songs on it, like No Sugar Added, Floating Away, and Love in Words, and I do like the little nods to the original OST, but overall the soundtrack is just kinda there. I mean, it fits the tone of the comedy, but not much else. It simply exists, and that's unfortunate because I feel like there was a lot more potential in the music than what we actually got. Not a huge thing, but I thought it was worth noting. So after all of this, it may seem like I'm dissatisfied with the reboot, but in all honesty, that couldn't be farther from the truth. I love the new anime, I think it's fantastic, and most importantly, I think it's overwhelmingly succeeded in bringing new fans all across the world to the franchise, as well as reinvigorating Takahashi's work in the public consciousness. I'm really hoping they follow this up with a Ranma one half reboot, as the original anime never got a proper ending. I've been critical because I care about this series a lot, and even though I've got a few little nitpicks, I am confident in saying that David Production has more than delivered on their promise of bringing Lum and Ataro to the 21st century. It's magical to see the characters revived on screen, and especially to see which manga chapter they'll bring to life every single week. This could have easily been way worse, and especially considering the endless incompetence of Netflix and Hollywood writers in rebooting old shows in the last 15 years, it's nice to know there's a lot of studios in Japan who care to see that the works they're adapting turn out to be faithful adaptations that inspire a new generation. And this show definitely deserves to stand in that category. But what do you think about the reboot? What did you like? What did you not like so much? And what would you change if you could? Let me know in the comments. But as always, like, subscribe for more content, and I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks so much for watching.